Hello. I hope you're doing okay, finding some peace. Maybe you even had a laugh or two recently, or at least I hope you're hanging in there. Happy to be with you again today. Hey, have you had a chance to watch Professor Chakravarti's TED Talk? If not, why don't you pause this video and go watch that first. The order of information works a little better that way. Or stay here with me and watch it later. Whichever, it doesn't matter that much. In this video, I'm going to get you thinking about the big picture of life on Earth. So if you have seen the TED Talk, you may be thinking, um, this is a class all about humans. Why did you just make me watch a video about fish? <laughs> well, let's think about all of this human variation that you see here. Everything we do, from sitting here, communicating over the internet, to talking to each other, falling in love, snuggling with our pets, eating, walking, breathing, this is all possible because our biology enables us to do it. And that biology is the result of billions of years of evolution. Think about that for a moment. Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago, and the evidence of life on our planet is first seen a billion years later, so 3.5 billion years ago. From there, life formed a chain of replication that still exists today. Every single organism alive today is an evolutionary winner. Every single one of us, you, me, an elephant, a fish, the bacteria in my compost bin, my weird cat, Wuchi, <laughs> all of us has a connection directly back to the origins of life 3.5 billion years ago. And therefore, we are all interconnected by an intertwined evolutionary history. We are all in this together. And yet, humans today have a disproportionate amount of influence on all those other creatures. So let's take a few minutes today to get some perspective on how many other living organisms we share this planet with and how the human lineage evolved out of this massive amount of biological diversity. Once microscopes were invented, biologists were able to distinguish two major cell types, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. The big difference between them is where the DNA hangs out. For eukaryotes, the DNA is inside a little capsule called the nucleus. For prokaryotes, DNA is free to hang out wherever inside the cell. The eukaryotes are things like plants, animals, fungi, and unicellular, or these one-celled organisms like algae and amoebas. And those one-celled organisms fall into a category we call protists. This diverse array of organisms all share the characteristic of having their DNA being tucked safely away into a capsule, the nucleus of the cell. And then there are the prokaryotes with their free-ranging DNA. There are the ba these are the bacteria, and they are everywhere. For example, a teaspoon of soil from outside has about 40 million bacterial cells in it. For every cell in your body, you have about 10 bacterial cells. Of course, as you see from the teaspoon of soil example, bacterial cells are very tiny. So this is why you still look like a human being and um, not a bag of bacteria. Our relationship with bacteria is complicated. Some do good things for us and some do bad things for us. And we're gonna talk about this a little later in the semester. Let me clarify something about the earliest evidence of life. Now, the paleontological record shows that the earliest evidence of life at 3.5 years ago, these all look like prokaryotes, so single-celled organisms that did not have a nucleus. It was a, more than a billion years later in the fossil record that we see evidence of the earliest eukaryotes, cells with a nucleus. The evolution of life on Earth, therefore, is mostly a story about single-celled organisms. Well, so perhaps it isn't all that surprising that in the 1990s, biologists discovered that those prokaryotes, 
they're actually quite a bit more diverse than was originally realized. In fact, there is a whole other major category of unicellular organisms that don't have a nucleus protecting their DNA. Instead of two major forms of life differentiated by the presence or absence of a nucleus, biologists discovered that there are actually three domains of life. The eukaryotes and the bacteria are part of a triad with the archaea. This third category consists of unicellular organisms that are thermophiles, meaning that they love heat. <laughs> They're found in hydrothermal pools, like what you see in Yellowstone National Park, where temperatures can reach 150 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 65 degrees Celsius. There are even hyperthermophiles who survive in environments up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, just below the boiling point. There's still scientific debate over exactly what the earliest form of life was like. I mean, we know it was some form of a prokaryote-like thing. But since our journey today is to focus on how humans fit into all of this diversity of life, we're going to turn our attention to a very small twig on the eukaryote branch, tree, um, branch of the tree of life that you see here. Even though the vast majority of the biodiversity on our planet is single cellular, we are going to ignore those other creatures until they show back up later in the semester as parasites, infectious agents, and influences on how our bodies work. So let's focus on the Animalia, a group also referred to as metazoans, represented on this tree of life by a starfish. Animals are typically multicellular organisms that can move around. They are what we would call motile. They are also heterotrophic, which means that they have to eat. So think about plants. Plants are autotrophic. They can make their own carbon, which is the primary component of known life on Earth. Animals, we get our carbon by eating other living things. The reason a starfish is a good representative for the metazoans is that they are invertebrates. They don't have bones on the inside of their bodies to give them structure. The vast majority of animals are like this. In fact, about 90% of the animals on Earth are invertebrates. <laughs> Let's take a moment to appreciate how uncommon internal skeletons are. Ah, so many insects, so many worms, jellyfish, placozoa, tenophores, cnidaria, etc. Now, you may not have heard of many of those, but they are all out there in their amazing biodiversity. <sighs> but now, we're going to stop thinking about them. Because now we're going to think about animals with internal skeletons with bones. But again, our view of biodiversity is skewed by how we interface with the world. This pie chart shows that 50% of the vertebrates on Earth are, yep, fish. The frogs, salamanders, turtles, birds, and crocodiles make up the next 40%. 40 Mammals, the animal group we are probably most familiar with because uh, we are mammals, well, they only account for about 8 to 10% of the vertebrates living on Earth. And remember, vertebrates only make up about 10% of the animals alive today. That means that mammals represent less than 1% of the animal species on the planet. And remember, every single one of these animals represents an evolutionarily successful lineage descendant from the origins of life 3.5 billion years ago. Some human humility is in order, don't you think? We tend to be unaware of all of these other organisms because we don't really we don't really realize that we interact with many of them on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll say for fit, a fish that you might have as a pet, or the rogue spider in your bathroom, or uh, the lice you discover on your kid's head. <laughs> we are biased by our own experience of the world. And as humans, yeah, we live in a pretty narrow slice of experience. For one, we live on land, so all those fish are kind of a mystery. And second, we live today. We were not alive millions, needless to say, billions of years ago. Therefore, it is easy to not think about how the past has shaped the present. 
and how the past was different from today. Welcome to the concept of the tyranny of the present. Archaeologists identified this concept as a way to articulate the hindrance people have in how we interpret the archaeological record. We tend to think of what past cultures were like in terms of the range of cultural variation we can see today, which is likely pretty narrow and nowhere near representative of the full range of ways that human cultures can be. We can extend this concept to even deeper in time. Now, one of the most obvious ways the world has changed that we easily overlook is the arrangement of the continents. From the changes in sea level shown here in this reconstruction of the continental arrangement and shorelines 60 million years ago, to the massive shifts the continents gradually made over geological time through plate, te te uh, through plate tectonics, shown in this little gif. Earth was different in the past. We will now start on a journey into evolutionary history, and I ask that you keep the tyranny of the present in mind. Free yourself from the constraints of your life experience and enjoy meeting some cool creatures that are unlike what exists today. I'll see you on the other side.